Pinterest first launched, I created about seven different boards uh, for all my favorite sports teams. So I created a Niners board, I created a Lakers board, I created an Oakland A's board, and I just put all kinds of images in there. And even today, I get pinned and liked and commented on uh, 150 times a day. Because very early on, I created all these boards and I tagged them with different players' names and different things I like. So um, I use it for personal, personal reasons as well as for business reasons. And so today we're going to talk about this idea of moving from pure social media strategy or social media and using the next big thing like Google Plus or Vine or whatever it is into thinking more about more um, about a narrative, a, a content narrative or a content strategy. Meaning, so you have a Twitter account now. What are you going to say? If you work for a winery, what is the purpose of, of having a Twitter account? What type of behavior change do you want to help drive? Do you want to get more people to buy your wine? Do you want to get more people to come to your winery? So that there has to be a narrative in the way that you tell your story. Mm -hmm. You're all students. I assume that many of you, some of you, or most of you hopefully don't have children quite yet. I have two little girls, 8 and 11. There was a book that I used to read my kids when I was really little, and it's actually a very emotional book called Love You Forever. Has anybody ever been read, read that book before? It's a really short book about a, it's about a mother who um, loves her son, and it, chron and it chronicles his life as a young boy, infant, into an adult. And it's very simple to read. It's a few sentences per page, and each page is a very powerful illustration uh, that anybody can really understand without reading the, the chapters. And the book goes on to show how this little boy goes into an adult, and his mother gets elder it becomes elderly. And, uh, and just that unconditional love that they have for each other. It's a powerful story. So as you think about whether you want to look for a large brand, or an agency, or a nonprofit organization, what is that story that you want to communicate to your customers, to your stakeholders, so that you can change their behavior? Any football fans in here? Who likes the Niners? All right, I'm still impressed. <laughs> Did you watch the Super Bowl? You guys okay? Did you watch halftime show? Remember the lights went out? You guys heard this Oreo thing? Remember what Oreo did? So right here, this little image right here, the power went out during the halftime show at the uh, the Mercedes Stadium. Within 15 minutes, Oreo tweeted, "Power out? Question mark? No problem." And they linked to this image here, which says, "You can still dunk in the dark." <laughs> Now, for a large brand like Oreo to create something like that within 15 minutes, they're going to need a lot of support. They're going to need somebody from a creative team, somebody who knows Photoshop, oops, somebody who knows Photoshop, so somebody with a visual arts background, a, a clever copywriter, and then the ability to create something without it having to go through all se a, a series of approvals. Right? Typically, a large brand, a large company, and I work for a few. Whenever you want to create some content, it has to go through legal, then it goes through the brand team, then it goes through the PR team, then it gets posted. The power went out in the stadium, and this was posted within 15 minutes. There were a few others. There was another one that didn't get much media attention because the Mercedes Superdome is obviously sponsored by Mercedes, which is a, a car manufacturer. Well, when the power went out, Audi tweeted directly to NBUSA, which is the corporate Twitter handle, and said, what happened? Did you forget to pay your power bill? And they took a little jab, you know. <laughs> but this idea of creating real-time content is kind of the, the, the next big thing. But large brands, or even small brands, and even smaller companies, cannot sit around and wait for the news cycle to create content. They should be creating content every single day. So let me, let me ask you a question. If you work for a large company or any size company, how many times do you think is acceptable to post a Facebook status update? How many people say once a week? Raise your hand. Twice a week. Three times a week. Some of you. Four times a week. Five times a week. Six times a week. Seven times a week. Never. <laughs> So typically we tell our clients, and, and Edelman, we do this for a variety of clients to include DW, Activision, any, any gamers in here? We don't watch Call of Duty, most of the, all, all four. Um, Activision, Skylanders, HP, Microsoft. 
We are posting two to three times per day on their Facebook pages. Now, we're not just posting anything. We're posting really smart content. We have a story that we want to tell. And so if you want to do something on the East Coast, you're not going to post at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, right? You're going to post at 1 or 9 a.m. So let's continue with the conversation. How many of you know what SEO is? Okay, so when you go to Google, and we all know that Google is the home page for everything, right? We, we open up a browser and, and Google's there. Google is the answer to all of our problems, right? We search for something. Now, how many of you actually click on the sponsored search results? The sponsors are the ones on the right hand column, and sometimes they're at the top and they have a little yellow background. Do you click on those, or do you click on the ones beneath? Beneath. The ones beneath. Those are the organic search results. Those are the search results that Google says, oh, this piece of content is important, so we're going to rank it number one. Because if I'm in the, the mood for a new car, or if I want to go to a new restaurant in Napa Valley, and I do a search for best Italian restaurant in Napa Valley, whatever Google shows up to be number one is probably the one I will all go to. Now, when you think about social media and, and figuring out all these tools, before you even think about that, you have to think about transitioning your brand. And your brand can be a small on the top shop, or it could be IBM. You need to start thinking and, and, and transforming your brand into thinking like a media company. Does anybody know what a media company is? Raise your hand. A media company is like CNN. A media company is like Huffington Post. A media company is like Boston.com. A media company is Time Warner. AOL can be considered a media company. These media companies push out content daily. Does anybody know what the Associated Press is? They publish 5,000 articles seven days a week, 365 days a year. 5,000 pieces of content that get pushed into you know, the Mercury News and the Chronicle and all these different places. And then they have a multitude of tweets that are used to help publish this content. Now think about it from a customer perspective. If you're looking for something that you need or that you want to buy or somewhere you want to go, if, if does it make sense for me to find a piece of content that is going to help me make that decision? And if you're a brand and you're working for Travelocity or you're working for Priceline and I want to take a trip to Florida, wouldn't it make sense for some of their content to show up in the search results or some of their content to be in my feed in Facebook or in my, in my, my tweet stream? The problem with brands today is they don't think like media companies. Let's talk about um, a few quick things. How many iOS or uh, iPhone users? Android. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't raise your hand to take a lot. I will throw this at you. Okay. Um, as you think about the, the, the landscape, right, there is a content surplus. Okay, so we have a multitude of devices. There's Android, there's Windows phones, there's Blackberry, there's a multitude of Android phones, there's iPhones, there's tablets now, there's laptops, and there's LTEs, and there's TVs. There's a multitude of devices, and, and that has resulted in a content surplus. Right? You go online, you see ads everywhere. You drive down the freeway, you see ads on the side of the road. You go on Yahoo.com, and you see ads everywhere. You go to your feed, you see sponsored posts, and you see what other people are saying. There is a content surplus. And as I walked on campus today, I saw a lot of people like this. This is actually in Asia. But there is an attention deficit, right? We're always looking down at our devices. I go to restaurants once in a while, and I, I remember not too long ago, this couple, they looked maybe in their, their mid-30s, and I overheard them talking about that they were celebrating their 10-year anniversary. Guess what they were both doing? Looking down at their devices. For like 15 minutes. That's a whole different issue, right? The point is, is that there is an attention deficit. So if you have a content surplus and an attention deficit, how do you as a brand or a PR person or a marketing person how do you reach consumers when there's already so much content out there and our attention is finite? It's very difficult to do. Then, take this into consideration, the fact that our lives are unpredictable. I wake up in the morning and the first thing I do is I pull out my iPhone I check my notifications. Then I'll go to work and when I need certain things, I Google. 
And there is so much content out there in life in general that I put up, we all put up filters, by the way. And those filters are meant to filter out the content that we're not interested in. We need a good example. When I was in the process of refinancing my home, I drive down the freeway and I would see quick and loans. I would see your interest rate to be 3.9% APR. I see status updates of, of other people saying, you know, I just refinanced.